Okay, hello again. Um, here we are for the second session of our webinar, uh, looking at the EU, Japan, India cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. I'm, I'm Celine Pajon. I am uh, the colleague of uh, Eva Peshova, running the, the Japan program at the VUB. Very happy to, to, to welcome you. Um, so for this session, we are dealing with a very uh, big uh, topic, uh, which is the, the connectivity. Connectivity in itself is very, very huge. It encompasses hard infrastructure, but also digital uh, infrastructure, soft, uh, soft aspect of it. So as you know, connectivity is really crucial. It's really, it's really uh, at, the, at the core of the what form um, exchanges and, uh, and and connectivity and um, and prosperity uh, of the, the the countries of the region and what allows uh, the country to, to 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 deal together to exchange together and also to for, to form some um, some corridors uh, uh, between Europe all the way to, uh, to 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 East Asia in a way. Uh, but connectivity is not only that, it's also the object of a kind of geopolitical uh, competition uh, for some sometimes now. So uh, the China has, um, has launched its uh, Belt and Road Initiative back in 2013, which is basically a huge um, plan for uh, infrastructure building, infrastructure financing in the region. And as we know, um, the EU, uh, Japan, and India have all been uh, very uh, willing to kind of provide uh, alternative uh, to uh, to the BRI and uh, to to join force also to uh, to 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 support uh, and build the the infrastructure in uh, in in the region. Um, so. Uh, indeed, we can see obvious uh, synergies and, and convergence. Uh, if you look at uh, Japan's free and open Indo-Pacific and partnership for quality infrastructure, uh, the India's Act East uh, policy and, and other initiative, and the EU uh, Asia Connectivity Partnership, which has, uh, uh, has a, its declination in, in a way uh, uh, and give, give birth in a way to the, to the EU-Japan uh, Connectivity Partnership and the EU newly minted this weekend, just this weekend, we had the, the EU-India Connectivity Partnership. So this is very interesting. You can really um, see the, all the, the, this kind of network of the, the, the link between between the, the three players. So one key question that we will be asking this morning is how to articulate this various uh, initiative and how to, to, to articulate this EU, India and Japan connectivity partnership all together, what are the, the challenges and, and, and so on. Um, and beyond that, uh, the COVID-19 uh, crisis uh, also highlighted the importance of fostering um, uh, the cooperation on critical technologies, but also ensuring the resilience of the uh, supply chains, production chains, um, and also developing a coordination in health uh, sector. So all, all these um, areas have been uh, discussed in the recent uh, EU-India uh, summit, but also uh, within the Quad. Uh, and uh, also during the G7 summit. So we will uh, focus first uh, on the connectivity because a lot of <laughs> a lot of many things to, 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 to look at. And then we will also touch upon these other, other sectors during the discussion. And for this, I'm very, very happy to have three really great speakers with, with us. Uh, today. Uh, first, we have uh, Maike Okano Eichmann. Uh, she's uh, a senior research fellow uh, with the Klingendel Institute in The Hague. Uh, she's really a top, top notch expert on uh, the connectivity issue, especially the digital uh, connectivity. She wrote a lot of uh, very good reports, including a very recent one uh, on the EU uh, connectivity strategy in the, in the Indo Pacific. So, uh, look at it. Uh, and she will provide uh, naturally the, the European perspective. Uh, second, we'll have uh, Ritika Passi uh, with us. Uh, Ritika is a Perth US Asia Indo Pacific Fellow and a visiting fellow with the Observer Research, Research Foundation, the ORF, uh, in New Delhi. 
and uh, Ritika has been looking at the various uh, connectivity initiatives in the Indo-Pacific, and she has uh, also wrote quite a, a lot on, on this. So thanks a lot for joining us. And finally, Ipeita Nishida uh, will provide the Japanese perspective. Uh, Ipeita is a senior research fellow with the Sasakawa Peace Foundation, and he has been working on a number of topics, including maritime security uh, in the region, but also connectivity. So thanks a lot uh, for being with us this morning, uh, all three of you. Uh, so we will uh, start shortly and just uh, before starting with a remark, I would like to remind uh, our uh, attendees to uh, write down your questions for the speakers in the, in the Q&A box and do not um, wait until the last minute because we have plenty uh, to discuss. Uh, there is a, a lot of, uh, of uh, news uh, also, so you might have also questions to, to try to, to better grasp what's going on right now. Uh, so uh, without further ado, we'd like to, to ask Maike to take the floor for the initial remarks. Thank you so much, Celine, and uh, to VUB for this opportunity to share some of my thoughts in this, uh, in this webinar. Um, I was very happy to find, first of all, that, uh, you know, it's, it's very timely with the EU-India connectivity partnership, of course, that you mentioned, just concluded last week. Um, but also the, the Indo-Pacific strategy uh, that was uh, announced uh, by with the council conclusions last month. Um, and then, of course, also the fact that you actually diverge from a focus of, on maritime and, and traditional security issues to this connectivity field. Um, so I really wanted to, to thank you for that, um, because I, I do believe that it's uh, the maritime security field is, is where the voices of the from the region, from the Indo-Pacific, for greater European engagement have been the strongest. Um, so it's only natural that we start, um, you know, many webinars with that very topic, uh, looking at what EU countries are doing. Um, and uh, of course, not just maritime security, but also maritime governance, as we just heard. Um, so, but, but of course, I think there's this other sort of very contested area uh, where there's much less uh, debate being had. Um, and this is equally important, I think. Um, and that's, of course, the, the high tech and the digital domains. Um, so indeed, in, in discussing some of my thoughts on, on connectivity, uh, I would like to focus indeed on, on the digital field because, uh, well, again, I think that is on land in a way uh, the most contested field. Um, so I'll be speaking from, from a European perspective. So that's a little bit of EU, a little bit of the Netherlands because uh, indeed I'm based in The Hague. Um, and uh, the EU is of course, uh, well, uh, now, positioning itself in the Indo-Pacific. The Netherlands itself has focused on cybersecurity, was one of the first countries uh, recently to have uh, an, an, a Netherlands-Indonesia -Indi cybersecurity dialogue, for example. So I think there's quite a lot going on here um, that I would like to address. Um, and this is basically giving a summary of, of uh, and reflections on, on very rapidly moving developments in three fields. Uh, first of all, of course, connectivity. Um, but second, very much related, is uh, the Indo-Pacific, and third is the digital domain. Now, in the digital domain, for uh, any of you interested, do have a look at the 2030 Digital Compass that was uh, published uh, last month. Um, it's a valuable document because it's really, uh, it really sketches the EU objectives, both internally and externally, um, in the digital field as we uh, go through this digital transformation. Um, and uh, one uh, well element of it that I will uh, discuss in a bit more detail in, in just a minute is the human-centered approach um, that is focusing on uh, digital solutions that help individuals and that protect individuals and that uh, create better, greater resilience of individuals. And I think this very much in line with uh, what Japan has also been doing. Um, so it's, it's wonderful to be in this panel with a Japanese speaker. And then, of course, also with an Indian speaker, because uh, India is where uh, much of the excitement is happening these days with a rapidly booming uh, digital economy. Um, uh, the Data Protection Act that's uh, still being discussed that will also set the tone for India's contribution in, in multilateral settings. So I'm really looking forward to hear um, from, from those experts also and to look at uh, how we can create synergies uh, and coordinate and perhaps even cooperate uh, in, in, this, uh, in this very important field. So the digital domain is one. 
connectivity, uh, just to, to, to summarize, uh, of course, in, in Europe, it gained swing in, in 2018. Um, it was, of course, in a way, responding to China's Belt and Road Initiative, which was started many years earlier, uh, but it was much more than that. It was really also Europe's contribution to this, uh, to this, to this field, and it's focusing on inclusivity. Um, and you know, that's, of course, reminiscent of what we just heard in, this, in the previous session. Um, and now at this point of time, uh, because the, the focus of the connectivity strategy was initially EU Asia, uh, it's now being globalized. And I think that's also in line with uh, some of the, um, well, the, the developments that we've seen. For example, when the EU and Japan uh, concluded their connectivity agreement in 2019, the focus was on three areas, uh, geographical areas. It was the very first time that the EU mentioned Indo-Pacific in an official document. So that's one area, but also Africa and Central Asia. And of course, a Japanese foreign minister traveling Eastern Europe uh, close to Central Asia was I think also an indication of Japanese uh, willingness to engage with us. Um, so perhaps at the next occasion, we could also be discussing not the Indo-Pacific region, but closer to sort of Europe's backyard um, rather than uh, Japan's backyard or China's backyard, if you will. Um, so then last weekend, the EU-India partnership on connectivity as, as one of several outcomes of that, uh, that, that highlight summit. Um, I thought what, what was striking there was that digital was mentioned first as one of the four domains of connectivity. Um, it, it used to be that infrastructure was mentioned first and, uh, and then energy and then digital and then people to people. Uh, but it's striking that in this latest partnership, it was digital that came first. And again, I think that's only logical considering the time frame we are in and, and the role that India plays and where India is at at this point of time. Um, then uh, just quickly the council conclusions on the Indo-Pacific. I think also here we saw quite a bit on, on security. Uh, cyber security, cyber governance, um, and um, in, the, in the Dutch Indo-Pacific guidelines that were published uh, towards uh, the end of last year, which gave impetus, of course, to this EU uh, discussion, uh, there was a focus on, on cyber security. Um, so I think one of the key elements as the EU goes forward um, in uh, engaging Indo-Pacific partners um, in this field is that we go beyond this sort of the, the security elements of, of the digital domain, digital connectivity, that we realize that there's great opportunities also in the digital economy. Um, and there's standard setting and there's regulation that comes with the development of these digital economies that will be crucial and will also be defining the way that people can and are allowed to sort of engage with this digital domain. And that can be, of course, more restrained or more open. Uh, and I think that we share uh, to different extents, as was also said in the, in the previous session, with, the, with several like-minded partners, including Japan and India, um, the EU countries uh, share this basic approach to wanting to have an open and inclusive uh, and transparency. Um, so this is important that we work uh, towards these areas. Um, so I think I've already said uh, the, the words that I wanted to say about, you know, why digital connectivity is important, but just to summarize, of course, um, these domains are increasingly contested um, and China especially is setting, uh, trying to set different standards, um, exporting also, it's uh, what uh, some people call di digital authoritarianism. Uh, we see, for example, in Cambodia already uh, a few months ago uh, or a few weeks ago, I forgot, um, that they adopted a sort of China style uh, firewall, um, which I think, uh, well, it was inspired um, by that country. So um, we definitely see the impact already of, of some of Chinese standards already going through the region. And I think it's in the, uh, in the uh, well, to the, uh, uh, to the benefit of, of all of us here um, that, that there's less of that and there's more of the European or the Japanese or Indian standards going, uh, going out. So what can we do? Um, it, this is also an attempt to, I think, reap economic opportunities that should be emphasized as a second sort of set of objectives um, and the wish of Europe to help build sustainable digital economies. Um, because, of course, as I said, the Indo-Pacific is, I think, home to a very vibrant digital ecosystem uh, where the European companies have not really been uh, engaging with uh, so much. Uh, the Traditionally, the ties, economic ties of European countries with uh, countries in the, uh, in the Pacific, in the Southeast Asia, have been the strongest, um, stronger, of course, than security ties. Um, 
But in the digital economy, I think there's uh, slightly less of that. So we can sort of uh, refocus in this domain. And of course, this also needs that we uh, requires investments in research and innovation, because the fact that there's fewer uh, economy, uh, fewer European companies active in the digital economies is also an indication of the fact that there's just fewer big tech um, of, from Europe. Uh, of course, the big tech is dominated uh, by Chinese companies and, uh, and, and, and by American companies. Um, and we see a sort of an, an uncomfortable um, position here uh, because, well, the, as we all know, the, the sort of the, the state security centered um, uh, approach that Chinese big tech are, uh, are promoting as they go abroad. Um, and this contrasts, of course, with the uh, surveillance capitalism, as it's sometimes called, of the United States big tech uh, as they go abroad. I think that Europe and Japan uh, want to find a sort of a middle way that, that allows individuals to take, uh, well, to, to monitor and to still be in charge of all the data that they put out there if they go shopping or if they go um, uh, socializing online. And, and I think for this way, it's important, for this reason, it's important that we also invest more um, in, in research and innovation because it's really through having, by having companies that we can export also our standards abroad. Uh, the GDPR, the data legislation, I think uh, of Europe, that was of course a big highlight in where we did not need those companies uh, to, to push for certain standards. I think many Europeans have been positively surprised by the way it's been welcomed and received and, 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 and partially copied by um, countries, or as, at least has been an inspiration for countries in the region. I think we're doing the same now with AI regulation, artificial intelligence, where the EU is also preparing uh, new guidelines on, on you know, what is sort of ethical AI. Um, how do we make sure uh, that, uh, that again, um, well, the, 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 the individuals, um, uh, the individual interests uh, remain center stage rather than those of, this, of the, the state or of a company um, through AI, where there's also important ways to regulate that. Um, but again, as I, as I said, I think there's also need for European companies to be more present. And perhaps um, uh, in, in digital infrastructure, there's great opportunities. Um, because there's still a need uh, for, I think, just broadband connection. So that's sort of linking to the hard connections. Um, and on digital governance, there's also uh, an opportunity. Um, and capacity building, I think, is, is, is one other area, specifically uh, digital financial inclusion. It's just amazing to see what has been happening in India. Um, how people have been lifted out of poverty um, or have been able to go online and to, to develop themselves through digital uh, financial inclusion. And I think that's an opportunity that uh, perhaps European countries can help, ex can help India to export also to third countries. Um, because we know there's, there's relatively little capacity uh, for Indian actors to go abroad, but there's this huge technology uh, base um, that again, I think uh, we can uh, we can benefit. We can help uh, third countries to benefit from by cooperating and trilateral cooperation. Um, so that's just a few ideas of of what we could actually be doing in this field. Um, I can also think of uh, and, and and to highlight how Japan and India are key partners um, in in all of this. Um, I could also highlight some of the, the challenges here, but I'll leave that perhaps to the Q&A and, and discussion because I think I'm running out of time. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot, Maike. I think it was a great way to overview uh, and uh, you did well to, to defend that the, the fact that the digital uh, connectivity is actually, uh, is actually key, is actually the, the core at the core of things and maybe one of the longer uh, hanging fruits for, for the cooperation but I uh, will wait for the for the two other speakers to, to confirm that or if, if they have an, another way thank you for um, raising uh, the issue of data governance um, uh, very recently at the G7 summit we heard about the data free flow with trust, um, which is um, a concept pushed by Japan, actually. So I was wondering how the, the EU and uh, India also positioned themselves vis-a-vis uh, -vis this, uh, this concept. 
uh, this is a question maybe for the for the for the discussion and and thanks a lot also for uh, raising the, the question of how, how to engage the private sector how to engage the companies uh, to, to participate in, in, in this and to, to invest and um, and how also you uh, you mentioned the, the EU uh, the US uh, China uh, competition the rivalry right now. And I'm wondering how it, uh, it's impact, uh, it, it can impact, uh, uh, you know, this kind of, of, of initiative of EU, uh, Japan and India. I can see that it's providing an opportunity, but maybe it's also constraining in a way um, things. So I would be uh, interested to, to, to hear your view about it. Uh, so now we are turned to, to India and uh, to Ritika Passi for uh, a, a remark. Um, thank you, uh, Celine, um, and I would like to thank BUB for this uh, opportunity. Uh, my comments are going to be broadly on uh, connectivity as a, as a whole area. Uh, to begin with, uh, my first point is regarding this question of what is India's connectivity vision. India does not have a uh, formal white paper out describing its approach, its vision. However, I think over the past few years, um, the direction of its approach and vision is becoming increasingly clear. As the adoption of Indo-Pacific construct has become sharper in Indian foreign policy, effectively, I see India's connectivity vision as uh, a tool that is being utilized to pursue the Indo-Pacific construct as a free, open, inclusive region in common pursuit of progress, prosperity, and a rules-based order. Seen through this lens, a number of initiatives fall into place under this direction. There is, of course, the already existing IORA, which has recently inducted France as a member. Germany, Italy, and Japan are dialogue partners. Uh, there are, of course, a number of interest-based groupings, Quad, and we're all aware of the symbolism of, its ga of it gathering steam at this particular moment as the previous panel uh, dived into. But more, I think it was a positive development to see the grouping find a functional footing through its cooperation, uh, through the working groups that it has set up on climate change and high tech, and of course, vaccine uh, cooperation. Um, and of course, uh, the uh, Japan, uh, India, Australia trilateral was mentioned in the uh, previous uh, panel as well, the supply chain resilient initiative that was formally launched this year. Um, then there are the wider Indo-Pacific initiatives. I have to here name the India-Japan-led Asia-Africa Growth Corridor, which was first announced in 2017. And I keep hearing that things are supposedly moving on this front. However, the pace has slackened off completely. Um, uh, India and Japan no longer even mention it formally. And the grand vision to connect Southeast Asia, South Asia, and Africa has instead given way to an emerging Japan-India uh, col uh, collaboration in third countries, obviously at a far lower scale, but the lure of the Asia Africa Growth Corridor, it remains. In fact, to the point that there has already been conversation and discussion on how India, uh, Japan, and the EU can cooperate in, in Africa. Um, then, of course, there is the International Solar Alliance, which was jointly announced by uh, India and uh, France. The Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, the Indian initiative that now post this, um, the India-EU uh, meeting, the EU has officially joined as a dialogue, dialogue partner. And last, another, a last initiative that I'd like to mention um, uh, in the context of this conversation is the uh, Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative that uh, the Indian Prime Minister announced in 2019 at the East Asian summit, which is an open inclusive blueprint that is based on uh, seven pillars. And we've already seen participation from uh, France, Japan, and uh, Australia. Uh, here, I have to emphasize or reiterate the point that was already um, uh, talked about in the first panel, which is the importance that India gives to partnerships, right? Uh, and uh, engaging in issue-based plurilaterals. India is seeking to actively co-opt a broader range of countries to not only part, uh, provide, but also participate in emerging governance architecture in the Indo-Pacific that it itself is party uh, to, um, uh, to helping figure out. Uh, and this leads me to my second point regarding um, a convergence between EU, Japan, and India. In the age of plurilaterals, 
this would be another great addition, I think, to an already existing overlapping network of um, issue-based partnerships that India is invested in. Uh, this one, however, could be more formally embedded within the, the context of existing and planned bilateral cooperation among these three actors. In terms of connectivity, for example, there is a clear convergence around these four specific areas, uh, transport, digital, energy, people to people, uh, but also supply chain resilience, standard setting, as well as mobilizing private resources. More broadly, uh, from Indian perspective, I, uh, from an Indian perspective, I'd like to uh, share a, a, a few um, common outlook, a, a few aspects of a shared outlook or common aims that make this particular um, collaboration or cooperation or this plurilateral uh, more attractive for India. Even as the three actors may differ on what the regional order may look like in the Indo-Pacific, they all agree on the need for a balance of power. Enough said on that. The next is the fact that India would like to strengthen its role in the Indo-Pacific, in the Indian Ocean, and then more broadly in the Indo-Pacific as a provider of regional public goods, as a provider of connectivity. Which better stakeholders to join hands with than Japan and the EU? They are strong infrastructure providers in, um, in their own right. Uh, Joseph Borrell, the high representative of the EU, has in fact called the EU as a connectivity superpower. The fact that it's uh, development aid and investment is often understated um, in, uh, in, in across the world. Uh, effectively, the three partners would be able to use bilateral and trilateral cooperation to amplify individual efforts and therefore their credibility effectively in this, uh, in this regard. And then, of course, India can more fully pursue a, uh, the uh, uh, um, digital and green uh, transformations along with the EU, which has been at the forefront of the green agenda, most recently visible under its uh, new green deal, and Japan. Um, a last point that I'd like to state here is the fact that uh, India recognizes that uh, both these actors, they in turn recognize, they have an appreciation for India's role in the Indo-Pacific, right? Enhancing India's domestic capacity and resilience, as well as its economic modernization is a key pillar of India, Japan and India EU relationship. The, the, the active understanding is crucial that the more that India builds and solidifies its comprehensive national power, the greater its competitiveness and credibility and credentials as a major Indo-Pacific player and rule setter. Um, when we talk about the way forward, how can these three players, what, could, what shape and form this trilateral could take? There are a few considerations I think that need to be kept in mind going forward. And uh, um, at the base of it all is effectively uh, some divergence. Um, the fact that interests do not always align and they do not always overlap as well as uh, the national context, uh, the lens through which each of these countries or each of these regions and countries and blocks is engaging with each other. Domestic considerations are effectively evergreen. Um, and today that is uh, you know, particularly um, obvious with respect to COVID-19. In the context of India, we know um, the situation at the moment, uh, the longer the infection persists and the greater um, uh, the more drawn out, the more slower, the, the slower the vaccination process is, the greater the lack of pace, attention, and resource deficit towards partnerships and international engagement. And I think this is a point that um, uh, was also made in the, in, in the, in the first panel. Uh, but beyond this, the health of the country and its people is at stake, given the poor handling of the crisis and the consequences thereof, rising inequality, poverty increase, a blow to India's informal sector, which accounts for half of India's um, uh, uh, $3 trillion economy, job losses. Um, the gaps that this pandemic has thrown the door wider open to, these need to be addressed sooner rather than later. Predictability of domestic environment is key for international engagement. Otherwise, India will end up being neither a balancing nor a leading, but an absent power in the Indo-Pacific as it fights fires back home. Domestic considerations can also be seen in another context in terms of uh, national regulations and economic nationalism uh, versus a desire to, uh, to um, actively, uh, to, to collectively act and align policies. And this could impact um, what we popularly use the rules-based order, effectively beyond a conversation of international law and uh, security considerations um, that the first panel touched, uh, discussed, there's the question of standards and norms. Um, 
we have, for example, the recent uh, conversation issue of uh, uh, waiving uh, patents for vaccine development, um, vaccine uh, know-how, as well as other drug uh, manufacturing. Um, this issue of IPR is uh, also, uh, to this we can add the issue of worker mobility uh, that has previously hamstrung India, EU uh, trade and investment negotiations. When we talk about science and technology, engaging in high tech, uh, ensuring supply chain resilience of critical materials, when we talk about data protection and privacy standards that Mike, you, you raised, consensus on these may prove a little bit more elusive than we may think, the more granular the level of cooperation and conversation begins, uh, becomes. Effectively, it's going to boil down to managing national regulations and economic nationalism versus a desire to play ball. Um, and I, 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 I do believe that the restarting of the uh, trade negotiations between EU and India, uh, it will be a bit of a, it will be a kind of barometer for the willingness to compromise and negotiate when it comes to hardwired rules and national interests. So we'll see. Um, a last uh, issue, sort of following the thread on, you know, this issue of national interest in domestic contexts. Uh, we often talk about, you know, um, uh, that any, especially when it comes to connectivity, uh, transport connectivity, infrastructure connectivity specifically, uh, and now this conversation on supply chains, that there has to be an economic rationale for pursuing, for changing, um, uh, for uh, building these, these connections. I'd like to say that it has to be acknowledged that the economic rationale of these three actors as they engage with one another is not going to be the same across the board. And this, I think, refers a little bit to, Celine, the question that you had asked um, uh, about you know, US-China ties, uh, each of these actors and how they uh, engage with US and China and how that can impact cooperation among these three uh, actors. Um, this perhaps will come out a little bit stronger in supply chains because each uh, the, the dependence level of each of these actors is obviously not the same um, across you know, the value chain, uh, across various value chains. Um, and I'm going to end with now a very brief comment on uh, trilateral cooperation that I'll be happy to develop in the question and answer round. Um, of course, immediate coordination and collaboration on COVID response and recovery. Um, but in terms of a longer view, because the bilateral impulse is already strong between these three actors, this particular trilateral, could it focus on structural cooperation that can help build into a bigger network of like-minded actors as they engage on connectivity? Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, the US President Biden has already referenced, has already reached out to, um, uh, to uh, uh, UK's head, uh, you know, to talk about an alternative to BRI. And there's often this tension that we see between filling in gaps versus having an ambitious answer to China's BRI. Um, could this particular trilateral provide some momentum in gathering uh, force among these three actors, but also developing linkages uh, with other players? If India's bilateral engagement with EU and Japan focus more on India's domestic infrastructure connectivity and bilateral connectivity, which I fully absolutely endorse, then perhaps this trilateral could take the conversation forward um, towards uh, engaging beyond the bilateral, right? And here uh, to end with, I envisage three functions that can be fulfilled uh, by this plurilateral, which can cross cut engagement on several areas of connectivity and resilience. Um, first is coordination. Coordination, coordination, coordination. I think that's key. Why? Especially because uh, there is a, a, a proliferation of uh, investments, of aid, development cooperation, of initiatives that each of these countries is uh, starting up. Uh, each of these actors has set up, is engaged in, is planning uh, to engage with, to engage in. So um, the idea is to pull together to collectivize information on unilateral initiatives, bilateral progress, especially as these countries often work in the same uh, regions or countries of common interests. Multilateral coordination, not just at the WTO or G20, but also AIIB, where uh, several EU members are, are, um, are, are members. The Indian Ocean Commission, to which India was recently admitted, um, uh, but also the International Maritime Organization. How the question should be, how can these actors connect with existing initiatives? The news that uh, EU and India will collaborate um, in BIMSTEC countries as a first step towards collaborating in third, third countries, I think is a very positive direction um, to, to, to pursue. 
The second um, a function that this trilateral should pursue is one of networking, right? And this, Mike, um, you've referred to in terms of, you know, the businesses, industries have to be in touch with each other, right? The idea has to be to facilitate access to people, businesses, finance. And here, taking from what you said, Mike, um, I would then also add skills, right? Which these clusters, if they are to engage with each other, can potentially uh, provide. How about, for example, a business corridor or a finance corridor by promoting linkages between effectively existing businesses and industrial clusters and financial institutions in geographies of common interest, like Africa. Um, in the, here I'm going to reference the Japan India platform for business cooperation in Asia and Africa, for example, that um, commentaries have uh, commented on and, and said that there is a role that, you know, uh, there's enga potential engagement with uh, other countries uh, there. And lastly, um, here I'm going to be very brief and I'm going to reiterate Mike here, um, the function to innovate. This is going to be crucial to create sustainable uh, economies going forward. The answers have to come from these countries, from these stakeholders. The idea would be to discuss and brainstorm what 21st century solutions these three actors can advance, right? Whether it's in terms of intensifying clean energy transitions, digital transitions, here, the importance of effectively of digital connectivity, even as simple as providing a broadband connectivity, for example. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna end here yeah, for the moment. Okay, thanks a lot, Rikita. I think it was a really terrific uh, presentation. You said a lot of things, you touched upon a lot of, uh, of uh, different uh, dimensions and, and element. And thanks a lot for raising very concrete uh, suggestion, recommendation, I think, uh, with uh, with Maike, we can uh, already uh, you know set up a kind of roadmap for the trilateral. So <laughs> that would be <laughs> a very great uh, you know uh, addition contribution uh, uh, for 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 the for the relation. So now I will uh, turn to uh, Ip Peitasan for the the Japanese perspective on this. Thank, thank you very much, um, Celine. Can you hear me? By the way, yes. Thank you um, once again to Celine and the VUB Japan program for inviting me to this great, exciting discussion indeed. Um, um, what I'm going to talk about is basically the uh, three folds. One is um, to talk about the basic uh, economic rationale of the Japan on the you know, corridor of businesses. The second is how Japan responded to this, this uh, COVID and the supply chain issues. The third, I would briefly touch on the issue of the cybersecurity collaboration. And then, uh, you know, uh, sporadically, I will come to the, some of the uh, issues, potential areas of cooperation. Now, um, remember the uh, um, key, the, uh, uh, the, the one of the message from the uh, Ambassador Shimokawa on the FOIP. You know, um, we have three pillars on the FOIP. One is the, uh, you know, rule of law. The second is economic prosperity. And the third is the uh, peace and security. And the, most of the time, the FOIP is uh, um, sort of translated to be understood as sort of strategic initiative against China. But the, what is that laying behind is really economic needs for Japan to be engaged in this Indo-Pacific region. And this is way before 2007. I mean, it's a really structural issue that Japan needs to be engaged in this region because we still rely on the Middle East for 87% of crude oil production. Now, that is really the, the fundamental, and it was more or less, or less the you know, economic needs. But uh, for the 2010, it has become more strategic because of the China's expansion and the regional inclusion into the area, right? So um, <clears throat> that is one of the issues. The stock maintenance and the, uh, the regional order is the, one of the most important factors for the economic prosperity and the vital of the, the, uh, for the uh, Japan's security. Now, the second thing is, as you know, the Japan is aging. Population is a serious issue. We are not seemingly not in, you know, integrating the immigrants. So uh, it is estimated by the uh, uh, World Economic Forum that uh, we will lose about 20% of workforce by 2040. So uh, we are not going to have enough production capability and enough demand, you know, domestic demand to sustain the current level of economy. So we need to look for the other opportunities abroad. That is a driving factor, another driving factor for why we need to be engaged so deeply into the corridor businesses because it opens 
uh, market potential, and also the uh, sourcing of opportunities, and the, uh, uh, to lower the cost, and the, to have more um, engagement in region to facilitate our economic activities. So we really need to understand those, you know, the basics to, uh, to understand the like, Japanese uh, intention on the corridor business. Now, when we look at the, um, the, 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 the uh, Japanese idea on the corridor uh, development, from 2013, uh, there has been a ministerial level discussion on infrastructure export strategy and economic cooperation. And this is a, one of the most comprehensive discussion that Japan has been doing on the corridor, you know, the uh, connectivity. So um, they've been doing like EA discussions and making the strategies, but um, it is really needed. I mean, uh, Japan is engaged in Southeast Asia. There is a distinct differences between how Japan wants to engage in Southeast Asia and the uh, uh, South Asia and Africa. The two, uh, two different aspects. Japan sees Southeast Asia as the growth center. That is an area where our businesses and industries are really engaged in. Where they can look at uh, the industries, uh, the, the basic infrastructure and the, uh, the legal systems and bureaucracy are functioning very well for our supply chain. While India and East Africa are less so, and I think the Japanese gov you know, government was really trying hard to have the engagement with in India on the in the in India market. But so far, with the, uh, some exceptions like uh, uh, Suzuki, uh, not many of the companies are succeeding into getting into the base you know, market. So now the, uh, uh, with the strategic, geostrategic interest, Japan is really engaged with uh, India on helping their uh, corridor businesses in Northeast, Eight, Northeast, uh, Northeastern um, region and also the Yagahu, uh, the Bay of Benga region's connectivities. So two of the largest Japanese ODA recipients, India and Bangladesh, that is, you know, shows how important these regions are for the strategic reason. Now, um, going to South Asia and Africa, so uh, these two uh, regions are important and Japan wants to be engaged However, uh, we are seeing um, much less opportunities for the Japanese uh, companies to penetrate at this moment. So they are trying to use uh, those uh, infrastructure development and ODA to be engaged, to build a bilateral relationship, to have market opportunities, and to hoping to change uh, effect on the legal systems so that in, in the, you know, uh, the infrastructure so that the Japanese company can later join into the, uh, the, the development. Now, uh, when I, I can change the topic to the COVID and how this, you know, connectivity. The, uh, the COVID, as in, like, in, in India and the uh, EU, had hard impact on the Japanese uh, supply chain, especially in the auto industry and like, you know, um, uh, the industrial machinery and like, you know, electric, um, electric suppliers. And one of the reasons because of the, uh, um, the semiconductors, as you know, right? Uh, because they can, about 60% of the, uh, um, the, the semiconductor fabrication or contractor manufacturing is in Taiwan. And we rely on Taiwan for the, those uh, securing those um, the uh, very key component. Now, so uh, we really had a difficulty, and I, I think I think the auto industry is still struggling because the semiconductor for auto industry is quite cheaper, so the priority is much lower. So um, the one of the things the Japanese government is trying to do is um, the, uh, uh, is uh, setting up the like, new supply chain resilience. I think they like to talked about the you know, supply chain uh, initiative also in Japan and India. That is, they don't explicitly say, but th what they're talking, trying to see is, seek is to have a uh, semiconductor and other key suppliers networking. So they're starting to have the forum of the business exchanges. Um, and another issue is uh, another initiative taken by Japan and the US and EU is actually, is on Taiwan. They, on the September 2020, the three uh, representatives uh, gathered together in Taiwan we had a forum on supply chain restructuring, mainly to discuss about how the, uh, the three, power, you know, three, two countries and one entity 
can jointly uh, discuss about the future of the supply chain, I mean, uh, re relating to the you know, semiconductor business. So these are a really important step. And we saw, uh, it is quite surprising that to, for us to see EU to engage in Taiwan business to this level. And this could be one of the, the forum, you know, the, whereby India could, you know, also join as a stakeholder, because this forum is open to other uh, like-minded partners as well. Now, another thing is the uh, the Japan is trying to do is the diversification of the uh, the sourcing for the uh, you know Japanese industry. So in the twenty um, April twenty twenty, as early as April twenty twenty, one year ago. The Japanese government was uh, quick to react to have the uh, joint declaration with ASEAN on the Economic Resilience Action Plan. And they have come up with like 50 plans for the, uh, um, to make a resilient ASEAN uh, supply chain, including financial uh, incentive for Japanese companies to relocate their facilities and, you know, and the uh, uh, industry basis into the uh, Southeast Asian countries. So these are big. And this is actually, uh, it's one of the uh, China plus one movement that Jap you know, the uh, Japanese government is uh, supporting, you know, to, uh, to have the wider the uh, sourcing possibilities. Now, uh, let me just touch on the connectivity. Now, again, the, you know, Southeast Asia is really important for us. And Southeast Asia can be the backdoor for the uh, uh, soft supply chain uh, target, right? So um, Japanese government is engaged with ASEAN on the capacity building, and they can also they to have the uh, um, intersession meeting in the ASEAN Regional Forum, so that they can have much more awareness and the capability to handle the um, the uh, the cyber attacks by themselves. Now this is another area, of course, that where the India and the EU can jointly uh, work together uh, with Japan. Of course, the uh, as Mike said, you no. Know, so which, you know, at which uh, background are we going to work on? You know, we have to be questioned, but then, you know, it is the area uh, of the Japanese uh, interest in, in the uh, Southeast Asia. Now, um, lastly, um, I would touch on the, some of the areas of the uh, uh, Japan, EU, India collaboration, sort of a new type of the uh, mini lateral. I think the, uh, the uh, two speakers, are your speakers, you know, you know agreed that we really need to have the standard setting collaboration, right? And we had the forums uh, such as G7, G20, and the, you know, uh, Richter talked about other forums. But, you know, we, if you remember, I think India is to have the chairmanship in the G20 in 2023, right? Two years on, and that, you know, G20 is a troika ship. So India is actually going to engage in agenda setting for next year on G20, right? And it is really important that the three you know, uh, powers get together to work on the issues that we have been talking about, um, all the, you know, digital transparency, the standard setting, and also the electric commerce, as well as the, you know, health issue. Because hopefully by 20, in 2023, we overcome with a COVID and try to normalize our relationship and, you know, in the future, right? So it's going to be like a really um, a time for the next stage collaboration. And we have two years to go on. And I think, uh, um, we, uh, we have ample time to collaborate. Uh, but uh, more in detail, I think uh, this relates to the awarded uh, discussion in the uh, earlier session. I think there is much of the interest for the uh, uh, EU, India, and Japan to collaborate on the anti terrorism, non proliferation, and arms control in the Indian Ocean region. Indian Ocean region is still not guarded well. I think the, especially after the you know, US pullout from Afghanistan, we really don't know what's going to happen, right? And, the, and the, um, India is already doing the you know, might and domain awareness cooperation with France on the you know, on Arabian Sea. But what about, what about the other side? You know, Gulf of uh, Bay of Bengal or including the, you know, um, the land connectivity. I think there is much of the opportunities for uh, possibilities that um, the three can get together to have a consultative mechanism for the information sharing on the you know, risk assessment, on the people movement and such in this radio. And another thing is, the, as I said, you know, I think the, uh, uh, there's much possibility um, or opportunities if the uh, India, um, EU agrees 
to invite India to join the, uh, uh, the discussion that we have on the uh, sensitive uh, supply chain issues in Taiwan. I think the, uh, that will hold, uh, the, that will send some, you know, some message globally. And, and also the, uh, if we can co-finance some of the major um, you know, the diversification of the industry basis to other countries. I don't know if it's going to be India or not. Uh, it could be an uh, interesting opportunities as well. The cooperation in the cyber domain, I think uh, your stuck and also mentioned, um, I think the EU is working really hard on this information in the European, you know, uh, during the you know, electric campaigns. Unfortunately, uh, we have not experienced that in Japan yet, but uh, we expect that similar thing will happen soon uh, in this, uh, you know, East Asia context. So um, if India, uh, Europe, and Japan can share the, uh, uh, the respective disinformation on knowledge and experiences, that will probably be foster a further collaboration of other areas. And lastly, uh, just to touch on the uh, health issues, um, well, the G7 uh, foreign ministers uh, talk, uh, I totally support, uh, support uh, uh, their joint declaration to support Taiwan's uh, fair participation in WHO and WHA, because it's really needed to have that entity to be brought into the discussion of the uh, um, maintaining um, the global health. And also the, um, I found the, uh, the Quad new approach was really interesting uh, to, finance the, uh, to finance and provide logistics for the medicine to be you know, being produced in India uh, to be you know, uh, provided to other countries, right? Well, I think the EU and Japan also have, you know, have similar understanding how health is really important for the, you know, uh, you know, development in the, you know, less developed countries, right? I think the two uh, can jointly do the similar, have a similar scheme to provide finance and logistics and so that to uh, invite uh, the captives to the uh, Indian uh, generic medicine providers. So uh, to, to be used for the you know the global pool, I think that all, you know is, is the uh, um, the fair uh, way of the working together. So those are you know, small things that I thought uh, you know, which came up to my mind to collaborate for these uh, three. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you for the presenting the, the broader Japanese um, approach to the to the connectivity to the various initiative in the region. Uh, including with uh, ASEAN and so on, and uh, so to point out to, uh, to other uh, possible uh, convergence and area of, of cooperation, even uh, reaching uh, out uh, and, um, and uh, going, um, you know, in, in, broader, in broader domain like, uh, like security or disinformation and, and so on. So now we are turning to the, to the discussion and, and Q&A. We have a few questions, but don't be shy. Uh, do not hesitate to, uh, to, to write down your questions. I have a few myself, so I will uh, mix them uh, all together and maybe um, take, the, and take the opportunity to, to start with um, uh, the question that was asked uh, during the, the first panel. And I will ask Maike on this. Um, so the question reads, uh, EU's connectivity concept is open and inclusive. So does the EU have a plan to conclude a connectivity partnership with China at some point? Uh, maybe in a, also in a perspective to try to have a kind of influence, try to shape uh, how China is actually implementing uh, it's, it's BRI. It's quite an interesting uh, question because uh, as you remember, um, uh, in, back in 2018, I believe uh, Prime Minister Abe from Japan also reached out to, to China and discussed uh, the possibility uh, under a lot of conditions, but the possibility for Japan to actually uh, cooperate with China on the BRI. So is it something uh, we can uh, think about uh, in, in uh, EU, uh, in, in Japan? Uh, do, you, do you see, uh, Ipeita-san, any uh, progress on this? Uh, have you seen any concretization of, 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 of this 
of this cooperation? Do you think it is realistic or not? Uh, and uh, Ritika, do you see that? Um, do you think that uh, India would be uh, actually willing to <laughs> adopt this kind of uh, of approach, or, or do you think it would be actually very, very complicated with, uh, for for many reasons? Um, if you agree, I will uh, I will list uh, several questions and then, and then come back to you, and and maybe. Um, to build on this question, one is uh, how to engage uh, with, with China on this uh, connectivity issue. Um, and uh, you related, you, you mentioned a lot of um, regional and uh, multilateral initiative, uh, multilateral organization um, uh, in which the, the connectivity initiative are discussed or should be plugged in or should be articulated. But nobody's mentioned the Asia Europe meeting, the ASEM. Uh, summit. So why? <laughs> why is that? Uh, no. um, do you see any any value uh, to the to the ASEM uh, ASEM summit? Do you see uh, it as providing a useful platform to to build up a kind of um, you know co coordination, bigger greater coordination uh, between the, the, the three players, or to uh, try to identify a specific project? Or um, would it be a useful platform uh, actually to engage with uh, with China on some of the of the of the connectivity uh, uh, project? Um, so maybe I would start with uh, there's uh, there's one and then uh, we will move on. Who wants to start? Mike? Yep. Sure. Yes. Um, thanks. Um, Asia Europe meeting and, and EU China. Happy to um, to tackle those two questions, and I'll try to be uh, to be short, um, but that will go at the expense of some of the nuances. Uh, so so bear with me um, on on EU China uh, connectivity cooperation. I think well, <laughs> as anything uh, that the EU does, it it has to come from uh, or and to be endorsed by EU member states, right? So. As with the Indo-Pacific strategy was France, Germany, the Netherlands that pushed for broad discussions at the EU level, and then it happened quickly. Um, so the EU cannot really start if there's no push from the member states. And I think this is, has been lacking, um, this push, uh, as, as concerns an EU-China connectivity partnership. Um, several reasons for that. Um, EU member states have tried, of course, we, 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 you, you must all be familiar uh, with uh, the fact that uh, Italy became the first G7 member, you know, as it was highlighted to, to, to adopt that, uh, that EU China uh, BRI MOU. Um, and it was criticized for it um, because it sort of seemed to en endorse uh, the BRI in the way that China has been promoting it, whereas EU connectivity partnerships have been very normative. Uh, the focus has been on sustainable connectivity, on high quality infrastructure in, in the Japanese term. And of course, if you sort of want to engage with China, that should be in there. Uh, the, this normative element should be in there. So just endorsing BRI is not an option, uh, but EU member states have been trying to engage China on the BRI, um, just not solely on China's terms. Um, less well known than the, uh, the, the BRI MOUs, I think, are the third market cooperation MOUs. The Netherlands has signed one with China several years ago at the request of China. Uh, and I know the Netherlands is not just the only one. And this was sort of an alternative to this uh, BRI MOU. Um, so the third market cooperation MOU, I think Japan has a similar thing going, is about trying to link, uh, uh, well, in this case, Dutch and Chinese companies working together in third markets to promote connectivity um, and to get to know each other better to sort of, yes, to see what can be done. So this is sort of engaging with the BRI, but not endorsing BRI. That was also the title of, of a piece that I wrote several years ago. So if you're interested, you can look that up. Um, it's at the Klingendal website. Um, I think that has been sort of typical of the Dutch uh, approach um, and of several other member states. And unfortunately, it has sort of failed. Um, nothing much has come out um, of this uh, of this MOU. Uh, what I heard from Dutch officials is that China was pushing for a MOU. It turned to be out that this was sort of that uh, the one that both sides could agree to. Um, and then after it was signed, after the ceremonial stuff, uh, nothing much happened. And of course, this has to do again with differences in standards that play out if you go to specific countries. So perhaps. Uh, if you could give us an update on, I think it was 
Thailand, where Japan and China tried this also, right? Also, nothing much seemed to be happening. Um, but you know, I think it, you cannot blame it on the fact that we have not tried. It, it just hasn't really uh, borne fruit. So over to the Asia-Europe meeting. Um, yes, I think several years ago, also the European countries were very optimistic about connectivity cooperation in ASEM context. Uh, we had a connectivity pathfinder group. There had been uh, tangible areas for cooperation on connectivity identified, five of them, I believe. Um, but here, sort of the same thing happened as, uh, as, as what I just described, that as countries try to move to sort of implement, to work out the practical details, uh, the differences between uh, several countries turned out to be too big. Um, and nothing much has been happening. And, and I have to admit, uh, I, I do believe that the EU is also not playing, uh, you know, a very, uh, well, positive role in this, if uh, in, 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 in all honesty, uh, because it's based uh, on the realization that it's been very difficult to push this forward in this uh, big uh, multilateral context. So hence the turn to minilaterals, uh, trilaterals and, and issue-based coalitions where we are now at. Okay, thank you. Who wants to, Mitika? Um, so I uh, fully uh, second uh, Mike's comments, especially on the ASEM uh, platform. In fact, I think the, both the questions can actually be combined a little bit from India's context in terms of collaborating with China. That that boat has sailed, I think, um, and from the very beginning. In fact, India was the first uh, country actor to um, verbalize uh, formally discontent with the approach um, uh, that is characteristic of BRI projects and instead to push for uh, you know uh, a, a, an alternative approach that is um, that is based on its extensive experience in development cooperation and you know uh, and wanting to promote that advance that and strengthen that um, uh, but in terms of multilateral platforms those are of course very open in terms of uh, wanting to you know that that uh, um, the, the, the age-old agenda of uh, wanting to um, you know, push China towards the light, so to speak, in terms of um, uh, liberalization, in terms of uh, reciprocal market access, uh, in terms of um, adopting uh, standards uh, with respect to its investments, um, sustainability uh, parameters. And we've seen, for example, um, the inc increasing attention that China and BRI are now placing on the health Silk Road or the Digital Silk Road or the Green Belt and Road. Um, but I think the approaches uh, that, uh, you know, multilateral forms aside, I think the approaches of India and China are too divergent. And this is to say nothing of the bilateral relationship that at present effectively precludes um, any substantive uh, cooperation, especially when it comes to an area where, again, the approaches are just vastly different. Thank you. Uh, Nishida-san? Yes, thank you very much. Yes, on the um, the, the third market collaboration with the uh, with China, yeah, I think you're right, Marke. I think we have the one successful successful um, the uh, case in the, in Thailand, the uh, East West corridor, I think. Um, but I think the uh, China also issued um, I think the report on the guideline of how successful cases were. In the, with the, each countries, including Japan and some of the European countries. But I, I don't think it, they are like really substantial or concrete cases. Uh, but the, uh, there are, I think, working on uh, had some cases. Um, on talk, talking about the ASEAN, awesome, the, I, I also you know, agree with the market's analysis. Um, and, and from the Japanese point of view, what is the utility of having ASEAN? Awesome? You know, where you know we have to engage with each of the 27 countries in Europe, as well as like you know, uh, EU and NATO or CE, <laughs> and, and it, it's uh, for the for Japanese uh, uh, bureaucracy. It is too many uh, points of the context, and they want to simplify and try to find the you know, uh, what is the strategic use of these uh, channels, and and it's really difficult for the you know, having the concrete result when there's so many stakeholders, right? So it's easy to have a smaller like-minded countries uh, like G7, or at least to have a common uh, ground or like in a G20. So, um, so those are the, you know, my view. But um, 
Japan is not, coming back to the you know, China business, Japan is not really against the BRI. You know, the AIB is, you know, are doing, I mean, there are alternatives for ADB, right? I mean, there's, you know, vast uh, infrastructure needs and ADB was not efficiently uh, responding to the needs. So, um, and, and I think it's also needed by the, the market, which is you know, Southeast Asia, uh, Southeast Asia and other countries. So um, I think that rather than um, try to um, deny the China's activities, we should try to understand how they are behaving, which also uh, I think each of the countries carrying, carrying, um, watching um, carefully and try to engage uh, with the, uh, the businesses that they do. Uh, but on the bilateral level, Japan, you know, the, the China is the largest trading partner still, right? And we cannot really uh, detach them. Uh, even after the corona, uh, the 50% of the businesses say they are going to more invest more in China. You know, even if the, the government says, you know, divert to the Southeast Asia, they cannot do it and because the market is so big and the stake is so high. So uh, I think that we really need, I mean, economic point of view, we, uh, we need to live with the China's um, the activities. Excellent, thanks a lot. So and now we'll move to the second batch of, of questions. And um, I will start with uh, one question on India's roles in, in collectivity partnership, uh, which is often seen to be that uh, of that on an object rather than a subject. Uh, so there is a Giulio Pugliese who, who is asking um, either of the speaker, but I guess it's, uh, this question is uh, naturally for Ritika to provide some, uh, some examples of illustration of maybe what uh, India is already doing uh, in terms of uh, infrastructure, connectivity, um, capacity building, uh, financing uh, in its region or maybe in, uh, in Africa and what in, is in the pipeline for the for the future. Um, also, I would like to, to ask all the panelists if you think that um, one of the first um, um, maybe uh, easier uh, area for coordination would be to, to imagine a kind of uh, uh, EU-Japan um, um, coordination in India to build up Indian uh, domestic uh, infrastructure to support uh, digital uh, connectivity or infrastructure or or do you think it would be, um, you know, interesting to look at, uh, you know, third, uh, third countries such as uh, such as uh, in uh, in Africa, in East Africa, uh, in which uh, we already have some uh, joint initiative by uh, by Japan, uh, India, and uh, and maybe also uh, EU, uh, EU EU Japan. Um, I have also um, uh, a sp more specific uh, question for uh, Ipeta-san um, on the recent uh, summit between uh, Japan and the Visegrad group in which uh, the Central Eastern Amer uh, Europeans expressed expectations for Japan cooperation in a three C's initiative focused on infrastructure development in energy, transport and digital sectors in the region surrounded by the Baltic Sea the Adriatic Sea and the Black Sea. So how does uh, Tokyo perceive this initiative and in which concrete way do you see uh, Japan would, uh, would engage with, with that? And maybe uh, another question for me because um, the supply chain resilience initiative was mentioned. Uh, uh, so it's a Japanese in initiative uh, working with, uh, with India and uh, Australia on this, so, so do you see any opportunity for the, the EU or some European countries to be plugged in uh, this, uh, this initiative? So the questions are first uh, for, uh, for Nishida-san and, uh, and uh, Hitika, but Maike, of course, you're, you are welcome to, to jump in and to, to add uh, your remarks because we are uh, almost at the end of this, uh, of this discussion. Um, thank you very much, Celine, for those questions. On the uh, Japan reform, I'm sorry, I uh, that was off my radar. <laughs> I was not taking the very carefully on this uh, initiative. But uh, the uh, Japan is constantly talking with the V4 on the uh, possible collaboration, and and I think the um the the uh, the proximity of the V4 is getting closer, uh, because of the mutual interests uh, arising. Uh, you know, 
the China's entry into their region and the Russia's are, you know, um, did, and uh, there are also their interest in Russia's activities in this region as well. So, uh, so I'm sorry, I'm sorry to say like now I cannot fully answer to the uh, the question, but then uh, the uh, um, the discussion is going on, so there has to be some meaning in it. On the supply chain resilience initiative uh, and Europe, I think there should be a room for the collaboration. I, I, they just started doing this uh, new scheme and trying to you know have the uh, uh, each of the uh, success um, each of the success cases and try to have uh, some of the areas of the uh, possible collaboration. And I think they, they are open to the other countries uh, if they want to uh, join. So uh, it should be good. On, on the issue of the, um, the, the third, world, uh, third country collaboration with India, um, Japan has been working since from uh, 2018, if I'm not wrong, um, in Sri Lanka. And, and, the, uh, um, and also um, Bangladesh, right? Uh, on the financing and uh, some of the uh, the projects, so um, but they they are making the, you know, the progress, but I'm not too certain if the project is really succeeding in you know, a integrated. You know, if they they could be like you know the collaboration can be, you know, take in many forms, right? And you can say like you know we are collaborating, you know you know side by side, or we are integrated, you know to collaborate. So uh, I think we really need to look into the detail on uh, how you know, the two parts are collaborating and how other uh, party can join the scheme. Because when, when it comes to like an ODA, you know, there has been a discussion of the you know, uh, alignment of the, uh, of the uh, official development assistance, but oftentimes the scheme is so different and they, could, they couldn't come to agree on the concrete project to do together. Right, because of the each of the uh, uh, the ways of the working working or the priority priorities and the method are different. So the uh, you know, aligning those schemes are quite difficult to work in you know uh, process. So uh, rather than uh, trying to find some concrete uh, projects like that, I tend to uh, agree with the uh, uh, Lichter's view that uh, we, you know they should start with the coordination. Try to see what they can actually do together, and, and I think the, uh, there is a point. You know, if there is a political momentum to do so, uh, I think it's possible that uh, they can sit together to narrow down uh, what they want to actually put on uh, progress. Thank you. Um, uh, so, to my intervention, very briefly in terms of the question about India as a subject, effectively, what does India provide? Um, three points. First, um, please uh, uh, look at India's neighborhood first activity, where India provides um, infrastructure, uh, financing, um, uh, loans, grants, uh, in order to uh, for capacity building, uh, that is a key example of the uh, the action that India has been taking has been taking and continues to take. There has been an increase in the pace and momentum of India's engagement in infrastructure connectivity around its immediate uh, neighborhood. A second example is uh, the uh, the activity of Indian uh, private companies in Africa, um, and also a little bit now with third party third party um, uh, cooperation with Japan, for example, as um, Ipeta mentioned in Bangladesh, um, and. Uh, 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 so the, the track record of Indian private companies in Africa uh, has held up very, very well. In fact, um, uh, that was one of the first sort of immediate, uh, that was one of the more concrete uh, considerations between India and Japan collaborating together. And it remains an open, um, uh, an open question, which continues to attract attention from Indian and Japanese uh, business and industrial clusters on how to actually engage with existing presence of um, Indian uh, companies uh, and the soft skills that uh, Indian presence has effectively acquired in uh, in in uh, areas such as uh, Africa. Uh, a third, uh, this is a, an example that I came across, and it, it also has to do with digital technology. So I thought it'd be interesting to share. Um, One Web Global Satellite Network is a uh, broadband satellite communications company. I was not aware of this. So to anybody who is already aware, apologies, I'm just going to explain a little bit. It is run by a consortium that includes the UK government, an Indian private company, a European satellite operator, and 
um, some of its investment comes from um, a Japanese uh, uh, SoftBank. They have signed an MOU with Kazakhstan to promote broadband connectivity in the country. And the first network demonstration is expected to be in June. This is an excellent example of um, private uh, 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 collaboration uh, supported by um, uh, government um, in the digital space in an area of common interest. And I think that effectively speaks to the potential, especially to build digital infrastructure, whether it has to do with um, tele-education, tele-health, uh, or indeed um, uh, e-commerce and basic broadband connectivity. Oh, um, and the, the, the second question in terms of absolutely, I think India at the moment is, I think, a perfect incubator. Um, if we talked about innovation, for example, whether it has to do with digital technologies, strengthening and deepening uh, broadband connectivity, which India, despite having the maximum, the highest number of users at the moment, um, despite having a large market, it still um, lacks uh, uh, um, effective digital penetration across the, the, the country. So, you know, um, that would be a very, uh, that would be an excellent uh, project uh, if EU, Japan, and, and India were to coordinate a project to, to increase uh, penetration of digital technologies in, in India. Um, but I think here, bureaucratic and operational uh, challenges and implementation challenges may come to the fore, but I think the potential is absolutely uh, there. And again, India as an incubator for several innovative, um, uh, as an incubator as well as a test bed for any innovative pilot projects that uh, companies can come up with, that research clusters can come up with. And here I think there, there is a, a strong need. Yes, the diplomatic aspect the diplomatic um, shared diplomacy um, is critical at the coordination level particularly, but when it comes to networking and innovation, that is where we actually have to let the uh, research clusters, the um, business uh, clusters, the startups, startups are huge, right? We have to let them sort of take the lead in terms of what are specific areas of engagement in India or in, in, in third countries. Excellent. Maike, do you want to react to that or? Yeah, sure. Just just very briefly and, and following up on a, a point that I already made in my uh, presentation. Um, I think the EU and EU member states individually are all sort of trying to contribute to what you said, I think, uh, Riki, Ritika, about uh, lifting India's role and position in the region and also supporting its engagement with the region. Um, and, and that's, of course, also a way of trying to balance uh, the, the powers in the region. Um, so there's been various, uh, various examples of that. Uh, indeed, France and uh, the International Solar Alliance and, and the Netherlands also as well, you know, sort of an odd member to that club, if you if you think of geographical positioning, but we became a member also for, for political reasons, I think. Um, so that that's one. And then there is the digital financial inclusion, where I think India is much more than an object, but very much sort of trying to lift India as a subject um, and, and, and trying to, well, to export all the expertise that India has and to, to allow other countries to benefit from it. Um, uh, perhaps a final point that has to do with, not with digital, but with uh, more hard infrastructure in, in transport is waterways connectivity. I think that's a very promising area also um, where you see uh, inland waterways that India has been trying to develop. You could also develop cross-border, especially um, you know, in the northern regions. Uh, BBIN, of course, initiatives uh, with Bhutan and uh, Nepal in Bangladesh. I think there's much potential there. There's European expertise in waterways, there's Japanese expertise also. So that would be an opportunity for a trilateral, uh, but probably more so in terms indeed of coordination rather than cooperation, because some of what I hear also from European players uh, in the EU and in, in, in member states is the difficulty of working with uh, very well established, very big and therefore bureaucratic Japanese players uh, like JICA. Um, that do a lot of good, but also, of course, have their own agenda. So trying to sort of get on board with that and, and to do joint projects, for example, as the EU uh, was, was initially envis envisaging, uh, has proven to be very difficult. Um, that was, in our view, I think, part of that EU-Japan connectivity uh, uh, partnership. Um, so trying to sort of, well, reframe that into something where we can coordinate and, and bring, uh, well, these initiatives uh, all together to a higher level.
Excellent. Thanks a lot, Mike. We are now running out of time. We are actually behind schedule, yeah. which shows that uh, the topic was broad and, uh, and very. Uh, the discussion was very fruitful, and I, I, I thought it was very fascinating to get the, the three perspectives on this. And uh, I think it really shows the value added of some uh, of this, uh, you know, track two uh, discussions to try to support the the trilateral uh, cooperation at the at the uh, at the political level at the institutional level we really uh, are quite um, uh, efficient to uh, to uh, to raise uh, some uh, some uh, recommendation to uh, to show to point out to opportunities to also uh, show um, highlight what are the, the potential uh, potential challenges because uh, we should be aware also of the challenges to make the thing uh, work uh, in a very uh, efficient way. So thanks a lot again uh, for being with us for the the three uh, great speakers for the attendance and uh, and for the questions. And uh, please uh, stay tuned for the for the Japan uh, program at VUB because we are starting our third model of uh, lectures on the Japan uh, foreign and uh, and security policy, and we will um, we will uh, touch upon the Japan EU uh, relation just uh, tomorrow. So do not forget to to register for that. Uh, thanks again for all the panelists uh, this uh, this morning, and have a good day. Uh, have a good afternoon, have a good evening uh, in Japan, and we are looking forward to seeing you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.